Good morning. Welcome to On the Spot. I'm Michael Vincent sitting in for Zach Strickland. Uh, with us, as always, is J.P. Hempstead. How are you, man? Good. How are you? I'm doing well, brother. We've had a, a, an interesting article come out this morning. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> big news. Uh, Uber Freight raises $500 million right. from a group of investors led by Greenbrier Equity Group. Um, really interesting because I think that the kind of the prevailing narrative in the industry was that the high growth phase of the digital freight brokers was largely behind them. They were rationalizing price, um, you know, trying to to lessen their losses, and you know, and some incumbents had talked about competitive pressures easing in mm -hmm. the industry. Well, now it's you know it's game on again for Uber Freight. Yeah, it's game on, and it wasn't that long ago that rumors are like you know Uber is looking to divest of certain things, and they talked about that. But there was you know the the conjecture that they were going to uh, divest of Uber Freight, which we had uh, Bill Driegert on, uh, and he he squashed those ideas. I mean, here's the proof, though, right? Yeah, and th there were a lot of rumors. Um, and we heard them, you know, prior to this article, and it was it was really, and especially when Uber Freight divested its Europe business to mm -hmm. Cinder, um, which is really like kind of a merger. Like Uber Freight's head of ops is now Cinder's COO. Their their head, their branch manager, their GM or whatever is now uh, the chief commercial officer of Cinder. So it's kind of like a, a merger. But in any case, after that happened, um, you know. The rumors just amplified again. Like, yeah. are, are they trying to sell Uber Freight? And you know, the question was always going to be, well, who's the buyer? Like, who has the money to buy it? How do they make it work? You know, um, yeah. Who, who has the money to buy it that doesn't already have Uber Freight's customers? Was it was another yeah yeah exactly big yeah. question yeah. But um, I mean, with this deal, they're clearly uh, doubling down. I think it. it it says a lot that Greenbrier was the investor. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. It's in, you, we were talking about this earlier, and, and you mentioned that it's it's relative. It's pretty interesting that Greenbrier came in with five hundred million dollars. Well, yeah. So they're a traditional private equity uh, firm that does a lot in transportation logistics. They they um, owned Transplace from two thousand thirteen to seventeen. They own Seco Logistics now. They own Laser Ship, um, and but but. It, this is outside of their traditional playbook because Greenbrier normally makes investments of 75 to 150 million dollars. Right. They normally take controlling interests in companies, you know, like private equity firms do, and it's normally like founder-owned or, or family-owned owned businesses that they that they buy. So them putting 500 million dollars into a publicly traded company for a minority stake is really unusual. It's a um, change in tactics there, a change in strategy there for them, right? Yeah, and I don't know. At what, least it, it's an exception, but maybe not a change in direction or anything yeah, like that, but right. it's an exception, it's, right? It's, it, and so when you see like a, a seasoned investor that's you know been in the space for a long time really um, you know depart from their traditional playbook, it makes you wonder like why they're doing that. And so it's like, do they have is the conviction that high in Uber Freight yeah. that they that they really really wanted to get in on it? Maybe they didn't have another way to place a large bet on the sort of the digitization of brokerage thing. It, it goes beyond digitization, doesn't it? Let's talk about the strategy there at, at, at Uber Freight and what that attraction is, right? Kind of the the bringing together the full, almost the full circle, I sh we should say, in logistics, right? Yeah, so um, when I talked to Lior Ron um, for this article, he, he referred back to Uber Freight's shipper conference, Deliver, which happened to, about two weeks ago. Super secret, the media is not allowed, everything is like super confidential, like, no, you, you know, it's not public, right? But he mm -hmm. just referred to some conversations he had with his customers. And it, one of the things that they talked about was integrating Uber Deliver with the Uber Freight shipper platform. Now, right. Uber Deliver is not part of Uber Freight. Uber Deliver is essentially how you can get Uber to deliver anything to your house. So yeah. it's sort of like Uber Eats, except it's for grocery, for just whatever. Like they've done pharmaceuticals, they do parcels in, in Portugal, they do um, you know all different kinds of I I anything really. Right. And right. so the idea is that by 
by integrating the final mile delivery uh -huh. with the, the truckload brokerage part, they can go to their, um, their shipper customers and really give them a lot more visibility into kind of in consumer demand. So like, what if you could, what if, you know, you're moving truckload freight for Anheuser-Busch, right. and then you could also say like, hey, Anheuser-Busch, like, you know, out of all of these Kroger's and, and Walmart's, mm -hmm. people are ordering um, this beer a lot. It's really taking up. You, you know, maybe you, you could sell them, you know, more more capacity on their truckload and say, hey, we need to bring in more volume here, you know, something like that. Basically, you can, and then, yeah, that and, makes perfect sense. And then for like retailers, like if you think about like a, say for example, Uber partnered with like a CVS, they could do the truckload into the stores. They could do the final mile out of the stores to the people's houses and really offer something that's pretty unique. So they're they're connecting into the distribution centers, from the distribution centers to the stores, from the stores to the consumers, in in the business to consumer, but also business to business, right? right even yeah, even yeah, hitting yeah. that type of final mile as well. That, right. That's that's and that integrates really well with uh, what they came the uh, uh, enterprise and and link, right? where they're, they're providing all this visibility and they're providing the data warehousing and analytics for these different customers as well, right? Yeah, and so, like, you know, I think that some of the steps that they're making take it beyond just a normal truckload brokerage. I mean, this is really, and especially with Deliver, but, I mean, the, the software and the, the rate, the speed at which they ship new software has always been just amazing. But... I think that like by putting Deliver and Freight together, they're finally connecting the Uber r sort of rides capacity pool with the Uber Freight capacity right. pool. Before, those were always separate. They always had different customers, different networks, links of halls, stuff like that. And you know, one business didn't really add value to the other. But now they're starting to actually integrate them and you and, and you know I don't know how big this will get, like the the sort of right you know Uber freight customers taking advantage of deliver, but I mean, it has a, it's it's super interesting to. to I, us. I, I think it's really interesting as well, just for all the points that you made, but also looking at what is going on in in logistics because of you know the explosive rise of e-commerce and right. and we don't see that slowing down. There would be no reason for that slowing down. That would continue. Uh, at least, and, right. and probably grow more, quite a bit. So now you're talking about the issues of uh, the next steps, if you've got this down pat, is the reverse logistics. Right, right, right. and um, comments were, have been made by uh, Michael Weiss, uh, who's a managing partner at Greenbrier, right. who basically says like they have invested in companies that do reverse logistics, they, they own freight forwarders, and they're really looking to help Uber, Uber Freight uh, extend its, its service offerings and integrate like up and downstream in lots of like super interesting ways. Yeah, it would seem to me if you can efficiently connect the, the final mile to the middle mile and, and the long haul, uh, efficiently then the next logical step is 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 the reverse right yeah. i mean a lot of people struggle with just the final mile but if you can nail that down and within that structure or the infrastructure of that service uh provide a, a cost effective and efficient way to provide that that return which is like 400 percent more than for e -commerce. order purchases yeah, in e-commerce. Right. I mean, like think that? about like buying clothes online. You know, it's it's so much riskier, right, than buying it in store. We can try it on things like that. Um, so anyway, we'll see how this goes, yeah. right? I, I mean, obviously, they have a lot of capital now. Uh, they have a long runway. They've basically told their their big customers, "Hey, we're in it for the long haul. We're not yeah. going anywhere. Let's go deeper." Um, but you know, so this is. You know, I, I just think it's 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 fascinating because it, it changes a lot of people's perceptions about like sort of you know a question mark maybe hanging over Uber Freight. Right. So let's 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 pivot a little bit. That, that was very interesting. And we'll have Bill uh, Drigger. It's going to be on uh, what the truck. I think it might not be next week or the week after. But he's coming up. He's coming up soon. Um, cool. Which which will be a great interview to yeah. to talk to him. He's always a great and very insightful and be interesting to talk through this a little bit with him. But it's it's. Uh, it's October 2nd, right? 
Yeah, so, so it's, it's the beginning day two of, of Q4. Right. <laughs> uh, Let's and, talk about the markets. What's going on, man? I mean, yeah, so uh, overnight, um, Tinder rejections tick back up. Um, yeah, they're hovering just, just below 26, like yeah, 25, so 25.88 or something. 25.88%, which is you know extraordinarily high. They've been sort of pretty stable at this you know high level for a, what, a month now. Which is amazing. Stability is one in four loads being rejected. Yeah, That's I know. stable. Well, yeah. I was right. talking to Kyle Lintner yesterday on, on freight forecasting, and, and we were joking about, you know, Almost like one in five or a little better in Ontario uh, loads are being rejected, and that's like so normal. Much freight. That was that's the end of the world two years ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's I mean, and honestly, like every mode is suffering. Like intermodal is a mess. Like ocean, like the the lead times for bookings have stretched out like beyond what anyone's ever had to deal with before. Like Air four to six you, weeks. They were. Uh, Chris is a Chris Richardson from Steam was yeah. was talking about four to six weeks now when it's normally like two weeks. Right, you got to so, get four to six weeks. And out. the you know so not only have the lead times tripled but the rates have tripled. Um, Air is being sucked up by you know companies like uh, like Sony and Apple that are trying to move electronics. Right, um, it's you know every mode is really feeling this and when you look at like the retail sales numbers when you look at inventory levels that are actually negative year over year for yeah. a lot of these big box guys. It just sets you up for a Q4 that's going to demand an extraordinary level of truckload moves. An extraordinary level, and if you're, you're a shipper, a carrier, or an intermediary, you've, you've really got to be paying attention to what is going on because we, we see it in different markets, as we were discussing earlier. Erie, Pennsylvania, which is which is not a, a, a sexy market in logistics, right? We don't talk about it all that much, but half the loads are being rejected there. And it's being, I mean, the behemoth of Harrisburg and Allentown and EWR right there uh, is sucking all that capacity out of there. The, the Erie's outbound loads are, are up significantly, but their inbound is dropping significantly at the same time, which spells a very difficult time for shippers, right? If you're looking at our head haul index. Yeah, there's no, there's no trucks in the market. And outbound tenders, there's no trucks in the market. Plus you've got Harrisburg with unprecedented volumes coming out of it that is just sucking everything dry. And that's happening in, in San Diego as well. San Diego, not a huge market, but their outbound tender rejects are huge because capacity struggling to to cover a lot of the cross-border markets, of the loads out of Ontario. A lot of the cross-border markets are really tight. Yeah, as, uh, is what I've heard. Um, Laredo, El Paso, you know, San Diego. So I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, pick your, your brain a little bit about you know people are talking about you know the vaccine's going to be here in two weeks or something, <laughs> right? And yeah, what kind, what kind right. of strains that that looks at? And, and we've discussed that with a, a, a number of people. Uh, yeah, I've had people ask me about that too. Um, yeah. It's hard. I mean. The Moderna CEO has come out and kind of said that their vaccine, you know, is really going to be ready in the spring of 2021. Um, obviously, there are other people racing to get a vaccine, and everyone wants there to be one as available as quickly as possible. But I just don't know that, like, it, is it really going to be a blitz where they're trying to get, like, everyone in the U.S. vaccinated in, like, a week? Like, like... Why would you do when you, I, I've heard if they're going to try to do something like that, they're going to need like 10,000 planes. Yeah, like, like I just <laughs> even come closer. I feel like it, right? you just start with like the most vulnerable, at risk populations and work your way out from there. Yeah, I, I would imagine you that they're working I mean? on those plans, right? I mean, like, there's, there's, there's people that are into the. I, I would think that you hit the, the most vulnerable, the, the essential or front line, right? To yeah. make sure, and then kind of gradually go from there. And I would there, think right? that the most. The, Populations that are most at risk are in cities that are that where like sort of like logistics networks kind of overlap. Well, yeah. like so, it'll be hard to get a vaccine to Billings, Montana, but there's probably also not a lot of COVID in Billings, Montana. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Relatively uh, lower on the priority list as as far as uh, we love you, Billings, but yeah, yeah. just to say. <laughs> so we got about 30 seconds left here. We're into fourth quarter now. It's the second day only, but before you know, it's going to be over. Right. What are you looking at in the fourth quarter? I mean, quarter? Prime Day is still coming up. Um, I think you know, in, in two weeks, basically. I think we're just looking at at high parcel volumes, high truckload volumes, reefer dry, everything.
Excellent. I, you you got to watch the, the volatility. He's John Paul Hempstead. You can read his articles, the one on Uber Freight on FreightWaves.com. I'm Michael Vincent. You can catch all of our shows on TV.FreightWaves.com. Uh, next Thursday is our virtual event, uh, Final Mile, right? Uh, yeah. Which is going to be very, very interesting. So tune in for that. Um, until then, John. All right. Very nice to be with you. Peace and love, everybody. We'll see you next week.